Okay, we're back. We're back in the afternoon of a given Monday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is Transitional Justice, where we, <clears throat> we transition in time and space to find justice, to make justice anywhere in the world through the help of the uh, Pro Project Expedite Judge Justice, which operates out of Kona. Um, and it's led by uh, Cynthia Tai there. And we have today somebody in Kampala, Uganda, who joins us. Um, by Zoom from Kampala, Uganda, which is a statement of the quality of broadband in Kampala. Fabulous. Uh, Gilbert <laughs> Nuagira, mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us today, Gilbert. You're welcome, Jay. Glad to be here. So you're an economist. That's, that's very important. Uh, I, you know, my college education was also in economics, so um, I know and appreciate a little about it. So tell us uh, about your training that you you know you took to be an economist and and where you took that and what your what your view of the importance of economics is in today's you know global society. Thank you, thank you so much, Jay. I think uh, uh, going through college and, and studying economics and uh, uh, doing the, the internships that I did, I, I I was fortunate to do my internship at the Bank of Uganda, which is um, sort of at the helm of macroeconomic policy and uh, uh, getting things running across the country. I, I, I just realized I was removed from um, the microeconomic issues that, um, that, uh, that affect uh, people's lives. And um, so for me, uh, the economics piece kind of drew me to critically think about what causes a community to actually grow. What, what are the factors that, um, how our community is getting out of fragility and conflict. Uh, for example, in Northern Uganda, um, um, in Western Uganda, in Kasese and in, in the East, how are those communities picking up? How, um, uh, how are they able to kind of build up and what are the issues that they're dealing with? So the economics piece sort of built that critical lens in order to look at what are the things that uh, have to be input to come from uh, to feed into how uh, people um, collectively grow back up and build back up. Yeah. Mm, I have so many questions for you. But before I ask them, I just want to ask you about something that happened to me in summer camp in, in the 50s. That was a song we sang. Okay? I only remember a little of it, but I want to sing it for you and ask you whether it has any resonance for you at all. Okay? Pardon my lack of voice. It goes this way. Kenya, Uganda, and Tanga Yika, CC as I DNR. Kenya, Uganda, and Tanganyika, that would be Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Um, I, I don't understand the, the last word, uh, <laughs> but I think it's, it does sound like uh, one of those songs calling to, towards. Uh, um, independence uh, of, of, of the three countries in the South African uh, community, which is, uh, which I think that, that the 50s, 60s were, were interesting times at that, at, at that time. And th th there had been a, um, a global drama up as well as, you know, a national drama up towards independence. And we're kind of uh, preparing to take on the realms of leadership in, 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 our, in our countries. And, uh, I think that they were quite interesting times for sure. Yeah. And they're very different now. How are they different? Um, well, for, for starters, it, it's different in Tanzania, in Kenya, and in Uganda. Uh, we've had uh, several leadership cycles. Uh, but in Uganda, you, you are aware that we've now had the same president for the last 35 years. Um, so he's been president ever since I was born. I have never seen another president. And that would follow Idi Amin. Um, no, that, that, was, uh, that was following Oboti too, who had been ousted, and we had uh, kind of a Paul Muwanga, Tito Okello, and those, those are the ones that were ousted in, in 86 to kind of usher in the new leadership and bring about fundamental change, as, as we called it back then. Um, yeah, has, but, it worked? But, has it worked? Um, I mean, I think for me, the question that is it working, I, I, I have very many reservations as to whether it's working 
So 35 years down the road, um, it took my dad three days to travel um, 500 kilometers across the country in 1989. And in, in 2017, when I was traveling up to Karamoja, it took me, um, it took me 24 hours to do the same. So if you count the, the, the amount of time uh, that it has taken to have a development, fortunately now it will take me about seven hours to travel the same distance my dad was trying to travel in, that, in the western part of the country. But if it takes me 24 hours to travel from, from Kampala to, to Moroto, I think then there is a problem. There is, um, there is a, a structure problem. There are inequalities that haven't been dealt with. And, um, and you're looking at areas um, uh, such as uh, Northeastern Uganda, which um, has, has sort of been left off, you know? And the moment they get a highway, it is peddled um, as, a, as a politically, it becomes a, um, a pen, political pendulum and, and the highway doesn't last, but people are excited to, to, but it has come in a little bit too late, you know? Um, yeah, that's that's my thinking. Yeah. Mm. So, um, does one have to be privileged to go college in Uganda? Does one have to um, have, have special connections, or is it egalitarian? Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a very interesting question. Looking looking at my own uh, education, um, my both my parents are teachers. Uh, uh, my dad just retired, but secondary and primary. So what that meant was that there was a certain uh, amount of education that we had to undertake as children. And education was, um, was looked at as the only way to kind of be lifted out of, 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 of poverty, out of being able to, to get, be gainfully employed. So it is something that culturally, excuse me, culturally, um, and, and something that was picked up throughout the 80s and 90s. Parents were selling everything that they had to be able to send their children to school. Now, now granted that not every, uh, every, uh, every household could afford to send their child to school. And, uh, and, 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 and the government came in with, a, with a, a universal primary education and later on an attempt at a universal secondary education. But all those had had their failings in, in terms of staffing and in terms of, you know, having the, the proper laboratory equipment. Um, so I think that would, um, yeah, I, 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 I sort of count myself lucky to have been able to, to go to uh, some uh, government schools, the government schools which are established, but you pay sort of a subsidized rate uh, to be able to, to go to school and, and of course, without one level, you can't get to the next level. And if you're not able to perform well enough, you, you don't get to uh, a, a good tertiary institution, something like that. Mm. Yeah. Why did you study economics? I think for me, I, I was looking for the, the, the critical lens at which to uh, look at, at life, but also the critical lens at which to uh, respond to some of the, the issues that I was seeing in uh, uh, in, in, in my community, because growing up, um, we had an interesting blend of, um, uh, of, of people in the neighborhood. And, and we, we did have uh, some refugees who uh, came through from Rwanda uh, during the genocide, and they were staying uh, in, in Mbara, which is my home, hometown. And, um, is that near Kampala? That is about, uh, I think, 400, 500 kilometers from Kampala. It's a rural area. Uh, it is. Uh, I would say it is. It is. It is. Uh, it has been newly. It is a new city, so it's uh, with with funding from the World Bank. We had all the roads tarmacked and all the lights and everything up. Mm. So in terms of, uh, it's a, it's a it's a it's an urban center. One of the key urban centers in Western Uganda, mm -hmm. which is um, yeah, uh, but that was not the case until about five or so years ago. Mm -hmm. um, Wait, so, yeah, I have, looking, I have a question for Alexa. Alexa, what is the population of Uganda? Sometimes she takes a while to think about it. Alexa, what is the population of Uganda? 
In 2020, the population of Uganda was 45.7 million people. Is she right, Gilbert? Yeah, 45, they're about, yeah. That's correct. Sorry. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I refer to my, my crystal ball over here, Alexa. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, what, why, did you, why did you join Project Expedite Justice? Did you, did you reach out to them? Did they reach out to you? What's the connection? So I had done uh, um, some work with, with Cynthia and uh, uh, a bit of trainings and we had worked together and, and I got a very clear and crisp understanding of their approach towards justice. And I think I was intrigued by, uh, in particular, a case that uh, was brought up uh, against uh, BNP Paribas, which is, uh, I think, a French, a French bank. Um, and uh, looking closely at how they had as a banker for the, the, the government in Sudan, they had sort of, you know, fueled conflict. And, and of course, we do know that for me as an economist, it's, it's, it's very clear that money uh, does uh, kind of a fuel or um, uh, kind of uh, where the money flows is where you kind of see conflict happening. And it's, it's also a, a, a great tool in kind of uh, uh, leading the way, in, so not, not leading the way, but in, Kind of preparing the ground to heal social fabric. So, yeah, I think those those are some of the things that drew me on. But the the, the unique uh, approach of litigation that that looked at where the money was flowing, and kind of you know went with that to make sure that people that were not able to um, uh, to have their lives that had their lives taken away from them could have them back. And and we all know that in conflict there's a lot of economic looting, so to speak, um, in, in, in South Sudan, you're having like uh, trees that are 100 years old and are worth millions in, in Malaysia and Uganda being cut down. And, and if you follow that trail, you, you see the funding that is kind of, you know, making the conflicts happen. And I think for me, that, that, that was a very interesting angle that was looking at, um, uh, things that were being taken away from community, but also connecting it to to justice and and and, and what that could that shape that could take. What projects have you worked on with Project uh, Expedite Justice? Uh, I guess they have not all been limited to Uganda. They're in other countries, other situations. Yes, yes, we have done a bit of work together with uh, uh, Cynthia on training on uh, on documentation for. Uh, for some uh, for, for for documenters in in Uganda in in Lamo, which uh, which receives um, uh, uh, refugees from from South Sudan and and what this training on documentation does is basically how are we picking up on the experiences that uh, are presented by uh, by people fleeing conflict the experiences of war and. And what patterns are coming out, you know, uh, and if these people are coming from a particular er area, are the things that they saw similar? And if the things that they saw are similar, what does that mean? How do you sort of to sort of begin mapping up and chatting sort of, um, uh, uh, what can I say? Uh, you have like a, a tapestry of understanding a particular experience and then tailoring uh, your intervention or uh, informing um, litigation, so to speak, at a later date, and and also um, to be able to know how to intervene, how to uh, because from that engagement, from that listening, you're able to respond to the the, the primary needs that the the the, the people have. Uh, for example, they could have um, injuries that need them to get to hospital as soon as possible. And and we we did this work as well with uh, with the refugee law project. You know, in terms of refugees and and uh, disadvantaged people, in terms of uh, you know, on countries that are in in strife, countries that are in violence, countries that are still seeking to find um, a reasonable relationship with with government. Um, how is Africa doing? It strikes me that you're not alone. It strikes me there are, there are many Gilbert Nuagiras around Africa. You probably talk to them. And there's a generation involving you that is actively working to try to improve 
various countries in Africa, some doing better than others. What, what is your thought about the continent right now and your generation and how is it affecting the continent? I think if I could extrapolate it and take it to a global level, I think we are in a, a time of reckoning, a, a great reckoning. I, I mean, I was just following what was happening in Senegal the other day and, 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 uh, and the youth are, are stepping up and, and you're seeing all this campaign. And we, we if you remember what happened in Nigeria and uh, the NSARS protests. And so I think, uh, and, and what happened in Uganda last year, we, we are in a time of, of reckoning and, and, and um, very many people in Africa are ready to stand up to injustice. And, and we know that the costs for that can be high. But I think it is also revealing of um, uh, very many things that were hushed over in the first place and systems were built up and, and, and lo and behold, we now have uh, structural inequalities that are perpetrating marginalization and, 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 and people can't have any of that anymore. So I think that is, um, that is something that is uh, kind of being sweeping up the continent, but also uh, it is there is there is a, a fire that that uh, people are uh, trying to take ownership of of of, the, of their future, trying to take ownership of their communities, and you know make them work for for them. And and I think that is it is an interesting time uh, for the continent, um, but it is also even more so an interesting time for the world. I think. Touche. <laughs> mm. So are things different in sub sub-Saharan Africa as in as, you know the northern part of Africa? I think um, so we, we we do have so the northern part of Africa, the countries that immediately come into mind for me are I think of Sudan and, and then Libya and, and and Tunisia and Algeria. You you know they they, they kind of had parts of, of, of the Arab Spring and, and Sudan is still uh, uh, kind of rising up from that i think it's that they are that they are in an incredible moment where they can uh if they can afford to do it they they and, and i think they should sit down and, and 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 ask themselves what happened uh, who was wrong and how can we now work together to build up our countries i think it's it's a it's 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 a place that that the countries in sub-saharan africa are at and, and what that means for me is, and, and what it means for transitional justice is that um, we need to listen to the lived experiences of everyone to acknowledge those experiences. So it means that the truth needs to be told in however ugly it is for us to be able to move forward. And we need to use that to inform how we now reshape and reform our policies, our frameworks, our, our laws that govern us. And I think that's the, the, the time that, that, that sub-Saharan Africa is in. And, um, and I think it, if you could mirror that with, with uh, I think it's also a moment that, that is happening in the US with, uh, with the Black Lives Matter. And it, it, it's also a moment of reckoning and to kind of see, okay, um, you, you know, the, the whole, um, I can't breathe moment. And so what has been happening? What have we, what has the police been doing wrong? Uh, what have we done wrong? What can we do better? How do we reform? reshape our policies? What, what, can we create a space where we meet each other and understand where we, uh, we can, what we can do to kind of make living in these communities better for everyone? Can we, can we do that? How can we do that? I think it's, 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 uh, it requires a tremendous intentional effort, but it also uh, demands that we set aside our biases, you know, in the first place and, and, and get to the table and, and, and shove our biases in the bag and be prepared to listen. And I think that is something that is, um, is quite expensive of late because uh, we, we are becoming more and more polarized because we, we realize how, how different we are, but we need to, uh, we, we, we just have one blue dot that we can be on. So we need to be intentional about, you know, getting into these spaces and and listening to one another but also being intentional okay where do we find our middle ground what needs to change what can change structurally in terms of policy 
what can change structurally in terms of the legal frameworks? Can we acknowledge that this happened and this is what it did to particular communities? And then I think that is a starting point to move forward. And I think that for me, that is where you, you have sustainable engagement and sustainable justice at the end of the day, because people are saying, this is what happened to me. This is how I felt. This is what I think needs to change. This is, and, and, and I need, we need to shape it together, you know, and so that we can prevent this from happening again, you know, and be, being aware of that and, and, and constantly, you know, working towards it is, I think it's something that we will enable, will enable us kind of uh, build, build back up stronger and in a sustainable way, if I may use the term. Yeah, wow. That's more than economics, isn't it? You're talking about economics, you're talking about politics, you're talking about the social structure of a given place, country, continent. Mm. How do you, you know, how do you see the relationship between economics and, and, uh, and repairing, rebuilding, improving, you know, a given country, a given social structure, a given government? I think for me, when I look at economics, I look at it as one of those things that gave me the tools or so to speak was, was an open door, but uh, to also realize that, uh, <clears throat> that in any given uh, uh, environment, we have a host of factors that are at play, you know, and, and, and they go beyond, they go beyond um, just uh, the, 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 the question of demand and supply. And even the question of demand and supply has a host of other questions behind it that you know that you have to be aware of, particularly if you are looking at areas uh, within uh, suffering from fragility and conflict. Um, and you have to look at those dynamics because then they fit into how uh, a, a place grows and they fit into the quality of life that people in, in a particular area enjoy. So for me, it's, um, so I would look at economics as that, that clean window that allows me to see all these things and to connect the pieces, but also to uh, it sort of inspires me to kind of, you know, look at carefully at the people that we we are working for or we we are part of, and how can we um, you know, work with them in in, in in ways that allow us to build each other up. Yeah, you know, we we um, we talk about engage. You talk about engagement, okay. And it seems to be central in, in the process you're describing, um, you know, working in the pursuit of justice, in the pursuit of a n n better community, a better life. Um, so what, what is engagement, Gilbert? And how do you see engagement? What does it mean? And how does it play in these dynamics? Mm. I think for me, engagement is about a word that sort of bundles up uh, a series of, of, of activities or things that we we need to be doing uh, quite uh, uh, intentionally, but with 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 great with great care. Um, uh, an example, so to speak. If if I arrive in a community, uh, or I have lived in a community, uh, have I um, do 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 I know that the issues that my neighbor is is facing? If um, do do I see the issues that we are facing as a community? When, uh, to use a, a, a more American example, when we go for the town halls, am I, am I listening to what is happening around me? Am I participating? So for me, engagement has participation and has uh, listening, it has, uh, and all these have to be intentional in, 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 in many respects. Uh, it, it has to be seeing, it has, being present in, in, in a particular place. And, and it is by doing that, that you are then able to uh, work with, not, not, not just work solo, but work with others around the issue to kind of work towards um, uh, sustainable sustainability or work towards uh, a justice that, that gives everyone a better quality of life. You also mentioned, and it touched me, uh, the word truth. Because in the United States, we've had some serious issues with truth over this past Trump administration and, and going forward for that matter. And I wonder where truth plays in all this. How, is, how essential is truth to engagement and to the repair, call it a, 
of damaged, damaged communities, damaged countries, and the rebuilding, including the economic and social rebuilding of those countries. Where does truth fit? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that, Jay. I think truth is a, a critical tenant of, of transition justice, truth telling and, and memorialization. And 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 uh, we one of the things that we one of the things that we, we quite often ask ourselves is is whose truth is it, you know? And 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 and, and when the government tells the truth and when the people tell their truth, and it's you know it's it's collective and you know they are speaking at a memory prayer or having a memory dialogue and say, um, and someone says this and this happened to me. So it is my truth. It is this and this is this is what I saw with my eyes. This is what happened to me. And okay. And I think coming into the conversation of truth is 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 um it's a very delicate act, uh, a delicate one, but it is also a critical one in terms of uh, curating uh, sustainable justice and curating you know engagement that uh, that 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 feeds and, and, and helps repair the, the fabric of society. So coming into that, we have to be aware that, that my truth might be different from your truth and they both deserve to be had. I think a, a good example of, of what happened, uh, of how truth was critical, and I think it is still playing out in Rwanda with the Gachacha courts and, and, and truth telling, and in South Africa with the truth commissions, um, of course, the details of these uh, engagements and activities were very gore. They were very, um, um, you know, they, they were very, uh, the, the word is uh, vivid and they brought back so many memories and flashbacks. So I think, but it was worth it because people then knew, someone could say, I know. But then does that mean that we do not hold our governments to a higher standard? I think from that community engagement and engagement at levels that allow us to uh, kind of be able to speak a truth, and a truth that is recognized, I think, and, and I, think, I, I think this might be a gamble, but I could bet that that will then, you know, fiddle up to, 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 to the government to be able to, to be responsible enough to tell the truth, you know? Um, because I think that is one of the things that that uh, that stars up justice, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, we've had we've had people in this country in the Trump administration that endorse the the notion of alternative facts. The facts is not necessarily the truth, and truth not necessarily the facts. I mean, the the facts seems to me bedrock, you know, central knowledge of reality. But there are, mm -hmm. there are people in the United States that are proud to create an alternative reality, alternative facts. And I guess my, my question to you is, can you have a democracy? Can you have a respectful society if you can't agree on basic facts, on basic reality? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a tough one. I mean... Because I mean, a, a truth is one of the things that uh, uh, one of the tenets of democracy, so to speak, and the tenets of justice. And our, our judicial system is kind of uh, our judicial systems are built up to kind of uh, look out for hold people accountable based upon of truth and and, and facts and, and not. Um, so for me, is uh, the question would be then how wh what standards are we holding each other to? You know, uh, do we hold ourselves to standards that uh, that allow us to sort of uh, fiddle with the truth and 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 have people saying, "Oh, this is what I did," but this is actually what I was thinking. Uh, but this is actually what I did, and I, I, I mean, I think for me that is that is where the problem is. You know, if there is cam uh, camera evidence or video evidence that is saying. This is actually these were your actions, but the alternative truth. You did it for this reason, but in you know in in doing that you were violating you know rights you were violating you know uh, uh, communal and community spaces. I, I think we need to step back and 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 think about what are our standards and 
and more than ever so when we are in an age that um, you can you can you know fact check you can uh, uh, you can do fact checking you can you, you can you know you know you can Google up something in, in seconds and know that this and this is is happening and this what do we do in in, in those times and I think it's the, the onus is upon uh, not just the leaders themselves but us uh, the the people to to be intentional about you know seeking the truth so to speak you know. Uh, and um, and work and how, how, and and I know that can be complex in 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 so many ways and and that can also be uncomfortable and and that can also mean actually even in an age of Google and 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 and, and Twitter and and all the social media it might also mean to actually walk out and and, and talk to your neighbor and 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 uh, and in, I know that that in a, in in a polarized world that that can be a bit difficult but we have to take the steps and say, hey, this is what I had. What do you think? And we, we begin to deconstruct each other's truth and, and we work out what is alternative truth and what is actually truth. And, and we, we begin to build up, rebuild a, a standard of truth to hold each other against, you know? And that's, that's my thing. Yeah. Gilbert, do you express these views in public? Are you on the media in Kampala or otherwise? Um, uh, do you... Uh, Speak to um, share your views with with groups. Um, do you express leadership principles to people in order to have them accept what you're saying? I I, I do have uh, great conversations with with my friends uh, uh, working in government and um, and 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 that is always you know that is always a, a, a joy and kind of looking at things uh, uh, from different perspective. I uh, someone. Uh, working in the NGO sector and research sector, but for people who are engaging in government, so it is it is always helpful to um, deconstruct uh, things. Um, I, I am not sure about our our. I do not necessarily exp express most of my views on social media or on 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 Facebook because I have also realized in terms of, of of the kind of engagement that you could easily get and disagreeing and you know. It, it, it does not necessarily happen. And we also have, there's a bit of, of, of surveillance. So I, I, I am careful in terms of those engagement. And I like to having this conversation in person over a cup of tea or coffee um, usually does, makes, makes a whole big difference because it, it, it personalizes the issues, you know? Yeah. It, it's a bit, uh, I think it's a bit old school, but I think for me, it's, it's a, it's uh, you know, coming to the table. It's 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 powerful in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's nothing like a cup of coffee or tea. <laughs> I know. Yeah. 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 So, Gilbert, I you know, I, I I would like to see this going forward through your eyes. I would like, therefore, I would like to know what you see for yourself as an economist uh, and a thought leader uh, in Kampala in Africa. Where where does your career take you? Um, do you have aspirations, and what are they? Um, my aspirations at the moment uh, and, and my trajectory, I have an, an inkling towards uh, uh, public policy and, and legal frameworks and uh, that, that, that hold people accountable, but also help um, repair and rebuild a society. So I have a, a leaning to those areas that I, I am I'm seeing myself um, uh, in, in, in advisory roles and uh, and working in that in those areas uh, and one of the things that is happening um, right now in, in in the East African context we we are sort of uh, trying to have an East African community so what is happening we are having migration um, uh, economic migration happening and we have Somalia has uh, has be to join the East African community, Democratic Republic of Congo has been to join the East African community. So uh, quite soon it is going to be a big block and, and, and more than ever we, we need the legal frameworks to make things work, but we will also need spaces to um, be able to listen to truth because trust me, when Ugandan traders go to Democratic Republic of Congo, they will be reminded that you stole our timber and we need to have a space to sit down and talk about that, you know. And when when Somali traders 
uh, come to Uganda and Ugandan traders go to Somalia, that's me there will be a conversation about um, the terrorist attacks perpetrated by the Al Shabaab in Uganda. Um, so we, we need to be able, I need, I want to, to be part of curating those spaces that will allow uh, um, uh, us to have those conversations that kind of allow us build us, build up as, 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 as a block in, in, in East Africa. Um, yeah, so that is, that is where I am at, yeah. Gilbert, it's such a pleasure, a joy, an honor to talk with you, to meet you. I, I hope we can meet again. Um, it's it's a very, very, so very interesting to see things through your eyes, even if only for a few minutes. Gilbert uh, Nuagira uh, in Kampala, Uganda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Think Tech, for having me. Aloha.